Good morning, folks. Everybody who has been waiting patiently in the queue uh, and have joined the webinar uh, already, we're just going to give it a few more minutes to give people a chance to join up, and then I will uh, run through the introductions and tell you what to expect, and we'll get the show on the road. Uh, we just want to give folks two or three more minutes uh, to, to get in uh, on the webinar, uh, to, to click join and uh, add, you know, join the audio and all that stuff, um, sort out any technical difficulties, and then we'll get started. I'm Jan from Yellen, by the way. I should probably have started there. How rude of, of me not to introduce myself. Um, I'm the editor of my broadband, though I'm not representing my broadband today, uh, officially, but, you know, I'm always representing my broadband. But today, I'm Jan from Yellen, uh, uh, a passionate uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, writer, um, who also happens to edit South Africa's biggest technology news publication. Welcome Dave from Mauritius. We're all very jealous. Great stuff. I think uh, I think we can get started. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jan Vermeulen. I'm the editor of My Broadband, and I have the pleasure to host this free webinar this morning, uh, brought to you by Glasshouse and uh, in partnership with Dell. Uh, and we'll be talking about some practical uh, a practical discussion on dealing with cyber attacks. Um, and especially in a South African context, but uh, this will be applicable in, in a broad series of circumstances because cyber attacks hit everybody all around the world. And so what affects people here will affect people likely everywhere on the continent. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mike Steyer, the country manager at Last House South Africa, who's gonna be going through cyber attacks in the South African context. Mike is an accomplished technology executive with more than 30 years experience in the information technology sector. As country manager of Glasshouse South Africa, Mike is responsible for managing Glasshouse Technologies' growing customer base in South Africa. He has a wealth of experience and wide ranging knowledge of IT platforms and environments. He's worked with some of the most respected global IT brands and has gained significant experience across a multitude of technology disciplines during his career working at these many leading multinationals. Mike, over to you. Good morning, all. Jan, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, um, geez, I couldn't have said that better myself. Eh? <laughs> Guys, I do apologize. I'm sitting here uh, under, under a, a light that is not ideal um, due to a power outage. So uh, making do with what I've got available. I do apologize for the fester look. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, Halloween has passed, so this is the real thing. It's not um, something that I, it's a leftover from my Halloween walkabout. Okay, guys, um, I'm going to quickly jump in. Um, if the host can allow me to screen share, I want to sh share my screen and go through uh, one animated slide with you um, about the exposure that South Africa has uh, when it comes to cyber attacks. 
Okay, and why should you be having a cyber recovery platform? Um, if uh, uh, somebody could just confirm for me that my screen is up and visible, that would be uh, great. Okay, when it comes to cyber recovery, just how exposed is South Africa? Okay, in uh, 2019, a, a poll was run and South Africa was sitting in joint fourth place with Spain, with Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, and uh, I think China ahead of us, Russia ahead of us, but we were fourth in the world. We are currently, according to a new poll done by Kaspersky, sitting at third in the world. So we are the country most targeted at number three in the list of countries most targeted uh, for ransomware attacks. Um, this is quite scary. You would actually think that much richer countries, uh, countries like uh, um, uh, the USA, the UK, European countries uh, would actually be a target. But this just goes to show that it doesn't matter where you are in the world or how, what the relative wealth of your country is or the advancement of your technology. You are always a target no matter where you are in the, uh, the, the segment or the setup of the global setup of where you exist. So, with the data that's come to the fore over the last couple of um, years with uh, ransomware being uh, coming more and more prevalent all over the world, Accenture have done a study and they've had a look, the global risk uh, over the next five years, they are saying is gonna be in the region of $5.2 trillion. Just think of that number, $5.2 trillion. If you have a look at IDC or Gartner reports, they generally speak about countries when they say, uh, yes, the, um, the server market um, in a particular country or region is so many billion dollars, or the storage uh, market is so many billion dollars. Think about this number of $5 trillion. That is what it's going to cost, okay? in risk, in preparation, in ransoms, whatever it is at the end of the day, in this segment of the industry, $5.2 trillion. That number is huge. Um, that is bigger. If you think about it and you put the numbers together, that's probably more than most organizations are going to be spending on infrastructure. Um, if they had to, if you had to divvy this up into organizations and say, or market segments, um, they are going to be spending more on preventing cyber attacks um, or paying ransoms or diverting away from uh, being hit, uh, it's gonna cost a lot of money. And uh, 5.2 trillion is just the estimate of where it exists at the moment. This is relatively new and emerging in the world. So that number could go up, it could go down, but you know, it's a scary number there. And I think the credibility of Accenture, they wouldn't hold, hang a number out there if there wasn't some kind of substance behind it. So let's go into what happens when people experience a cyber attack. Mimecast, of which over 20% of the world's mail somehow travels through Mimecast at some stage. They are saying, this is an observation from their side. They are saying the average downtime experienced by their customers is five to seven days when they experience a cyber event. So when they are hit by ransomware or something along those lines, it takes five to seven days for these people to get their email systems back up and running. That's not to say their whole system is back up and running. That's not to say everything is recovered. That is just email. But still, five to seven days is a significant time in the life of any organization that is transacting online, um, that is customer facing, um, that, that needs to be able to operate within the digital world uh, five to seven days is an eternity of downtime um, if you live on the internet and if your business is built on the internet. So if we have a look what Interpol is saying, South Africa has experienced 1.5 million attacks last year. Okay, They've detected people trying to execute on ransomware attacks, trying to get into organizations and trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and, and trying to uh, effectively extort money from companies. So 1.5 million detected 
ransomware uh, 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 attempts or events. Now, how many went undetected? Let's say they capture in 50 to 60%. That number would be significantly higher. And these are numbers from a global Interpol uh, survey that was run. And I think the numbers are reasonably credible. Um, so in South Africa, 1.5 million detections of attempted and uh, successful ransomware attacks in South Africa. That's a significant number. Sophos have done a survey and they've gone out and had a look and they said that, <clears throat> excuse me, 24% of people, organizations out there, have been able to recover. They've been able to restore their data based on the nature of the attack, based on where they have data residing, based on the contingencies that they had in place for recovery from a cyber attack. Now, we must remember that cyber, a cyber resilience platform is not the same as normal backup. It's not the same as disaster recovery. It's a whole new component on the disaster uh, recovery or let's say the business continuity continuum. It is a new component. It is not uh, disaster recovery. It is not backup. And you have to look at it in isolation, um, whereas the other two have very specific areas and they have very specific outcomes, desired outcomes, um, when an event happens. So backup is there for a particular reason, disaster recovery there is for a particular bunch of reasons. Cyber resilience has its own space. And the platform that you build is not and should not be dependent on any of the others. Yes, it could be tightly coupled and they could feed off of each other, but they are not uh, they are all mutually exclusive from each other. So 24% of customers uh, or people that experience cyber attacks were able to uh, weather the storm and to get their applications back up and running. Some took very short periods of time, some took very long periods of time, but 24% of people were able to restore and get back up and running. That kind of leaves you wondering about what happened to the other 76% when uh, only 24% were able to recover. So where did that leave the remaining 76% of people that experienced a cyber attack of sorts? Um, and what happened to them? Well, Sophos has said 42% of those people sit back and listen to that number. 42% of people paid the ransom. 42% of organizations aided and abetted criminality. That is scary. And that is what people are, are reporting. These are people that are willing to go out there and say, yes, we experienced a cyber event and we had no other alternative but to pay the ransom. How many people are admitting to that? I think these people are very brave to, to, to do that. But how many people out there are admitting uh, that when it comes to a, a cyber, a successful cyber attack against them, that they actually paid the ransom. I think many companies are keeping quiet, and I think that 42% is significantly higher. Um, you know, that's just my my gut feel, but I really believe that uh, that number is probably closer. Of the 74% that could not recover in the entirety, probably a substantial component of that number uh, is uh, people have been paying the ransom and. Uh, the reputational damage uh, that comes with it, people have decided rather let's do it, let's get rid of this and uh, then we'll build some kind of a contingency. And we are seeing the people that embrace this and are really showing the most level of urgency, the organizations that are showing the most level of uh, urgency when it comes to building a cyber resilience platform. Those are the people that have experienced cyber attacks, perhaps have paid the ransom, um, or they've had near misses and have now decided that this is more than insurance. This is something that they have to do. So Verizon annually deliver a report, which is the litmus test of the IT world in certain areas. And what they are saying is that 71% of breaches are currently financially motivated. If you look at five years ago, hacking, as it was known in those days, was by people who would, uh, that had an axe to grind, maybe a bit of industrial espionage. Um, but most of the hacking was being done by people because they could, because they can, and they wanted to make a point or uh, some kind of activist trying to prove something. That has shifted. 
And this world, this realm has now become the place of the cyber criminal. 71% of attacks out there are financially motivated by people who want to extort money out of you. Bottom line, that's what it is. 71% of the attacks out there are being run by criminals and criminal syndicates. This is actually scary because uh, these guys are working really hard to stay ahead of the curve. They're finding holes in applications, in uh, operating systems. They're exploiting them all the time. Um, at the moment, you are seeing every other day, this uh, exploit has been closed, that exploit has been closed, uh, this has been sorted out. There is a massive amount of work being done on both sides. Make no mistake, these criminals are working really, really hard uh, to find new ways to attack you. And um, organizations are working really, really hard to try and stop this. But 71% of any type of breach or any type of attempted breach is motivated to extort money out of your organization. <clears throat> so a lot of people believe that this is something that fire ransomware, people with money are going to be targeted. This is a, a, a space where the uh, where high profitability and lots of money is available. That is not the truth. The Verizon report has picked up that 43% of breaches are actually happening to smaller businesses. So it doesn't matter where you sit. Are you a big corporate listed or are you a small organization? There are guys out there, there are cyber criminals out there that are going to try and extort $100,000 from 100 different customers. And there are guys that are going to go try and extort $100 million from 10 customers. So doesn't matter where you sit, in what segment of the marketplace you sit, you are exposed. Whether you're big, small, um, it doesn't matter. Whether you're government, whether you're mining, uh, whether you're medical, whether you're financial, it doesn't matter what seg uh, segment of the marketplace you exist, you are a target. And it is not a matter of if you get a cyber attack against you. It really is a matter of when a cyber attack happens. And when this happens, you've got to be asking yourself, are you prepared? If you look at the statistics that I've just put up here, I know these are all very, very credible statistics that have been put up and pushed up. 24% um, of people currently, 24% of people surveyed by Sophos were able to recover. 76% leaves a question mark against. Okay, and of that, 42% actually paid the ransom, which basically tells you there was no preparedness amongst 42% of people that are gutsy enough to say we experienced a cyber attack and paid the ransom. That number, as I said, in my personal opinion, is probably significantly higher. And I do believe that uh, this is the scourge. This is going to be the talk, the virtual days of virtualization and how we, what hypervisor are we going to run and cloud and all that are going to be overshadowed by this discussion for the next two to three years. And when the IT guys sit together and start exchanging war stories, it's they're going to be talking about not how long it took them to convert or transform or implement uh, an ERP system. They're going to be talking about their last cyber hit. Make no mistake, this is something that is going to live with us. And it is something that we have to be prepared for. And it's going to take significant work right away from the boardroom all the way down to the lowest operational person. These type of threats are going to walk through the front door. The way the world has changed, people are working on open and um, unprotected networks. Anything could be pushed onto their PCs. There are so many loopholes that can be extended with the amount of applications that are merged, uh, emerging and can be put into organizations on a daily basis. And let's face it, one of the most common ways that ransomware or the back doors are being opened for the cyber criminals to get into your systems is through bribing an employee. So there's nobody at the end of the day is really safe. And the measures that you currently have in place that are outward facing, when the breach happens, and many of the security guys out there currently believe they cannot be breached, they're doing all the penetration testing, they have ethical hacking, and everything's happening on that side, nobody's going to get in. 
you have to have the contingency in place that once the castle walls are breached and somebody's going after the crown jewels, you have a palatial guard or a royal guard that is going to stop that. And that is what we are speaking and presenting it today. We are going to be providing you with information about the Rolls-Royce solution that we believe is the Rolls-Royce solution out there, available from, from Dell, built on tried and tested infrastructure. It's using leading edge artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, capabilities that are built into the software that scans and looks uh, after your data, making sure and trying to make 100% sure that they detect every type of ransomware pattern or changing your data that could indicate that there's a ransomware event in the, in the, in the making happening inside your organization. <clears throat> and that is leading edge. It does not expose you by putting you into the cloud. It all runs on premise and it follows the tenants or the pillars that have been put in place by the industry watchdogs for data that is separated away from your current users, network systems, it is air gapped. It cannot be um, accessed by anything else inside your organization. It is kept in a secure place, a vault, as it is known, that cannot be accessed by anybody for any reason whatsoever, whether that's physically or logically. And it gives you an immutable copy of your data, a golden copy. So even if there's ransomware injected into it, you have a golden copy of your data. This solution follows all of those pillars or those tenets of what is re the requirement of building a cyber recovery platform that conforms and has most of the industry standard authorities or has all of the industry standard authorities rubber stamp of approval. Um, and then on top of that, you have the watchdog in the analytics uh, that run using the AI and machine learning that should and will detect any kind of event before it happens and put you in a good position that you should never get ransomware. And if at the end of the day you do, you have that golden copy of data, which is going to allow you to resume your business. It's going to allow you to start restoring and getting everything back together. So that's the high level. I'm not going to talk any further about that because I will mangle it. I'm going to leave the two experts, Matthew McEnroe from Dell and Rudolf Asahi from Glasshouse. And they are going to go over this in much greater detail, giving you an idea of what the Rolls-Royce solution available from Dell looks like and how it can be implemented and what your risks are. So over to you, Jan. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. And uh, guys, um, enjoy the rest of the, the, the webinar. Thank you so much, Mike. It's, uh, it's really eye-opening. You know, you hear about the attacks happening to, to prominent businesses. Uh, we report on it all the time. But seeing actual statistics from a, from a survey showing, uh, uh, you know, giving an, a, a, an idea of just how bad it is out there with ransomware at the moment uh, is, is really eye-opening. Uh, only 24% recoveries, um, you know, 42% of people are paying the, the ransom. Um, th those, those are numbers to mull over, I think. Um, before I hand over to Matthew, uh, a couple of things are happening. So we will be running some polls uh, through the course of the event. So right now there's a, there's a poll up. Uh, please uh, please uh, do uh, answer the poll questions and, uh, and then we'll uh, be able to report back on that. And then I'd also like to ask folks, everybody tuning in right now, uh, if you've got a question, start writing it out right now. There's a Q&A uh, tab open. So you'll see the questions and answers button usually at the bottom of your Zoom interface. And start uh, thinking of your question and posting it uh, in there already. We'll have time for a live Q&A at the end of the event. And uh, it can sometimes take a while to, to, to type your question in. So if we've got the list of questions before we go into the Q&A, we'll be able to go through them speedily before everybody logs off for the day. So yeah, please get those questions and answers in so long. Now, without further ado, I'd, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Matthew McEnroe, a systems engineer at Dell Technologies to the event. 
Matthew is a passionate technologist with a keen interest in future technologies that will change the world. He holds a position as systems engineer at Dell and is highly accredited in a variety of platforms. He has a deep understanding of the current cybercrime environment and can provide insight into how these crimes impact business. Matthew, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction there, um, Jan and, uh, and Mike. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you guys this morning. Um, it's always great to, to be presenting with Glasshouse. Um, you know, as one of the, the Dell strategic partners in our region, it, it's, it's always awesome to, to share our learnings. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. I don't actually have to introduce myself. Uh, so I'll, I'll just get straight into it. Um, how I like to normally start is to show our perspective from, from Dell Technologies. Um, you know, where this all started for us, you know, 10 years ago, is having our customers, you know, fit into different strategies all over the globe in terms of security and compliance. And so we've always been, you know, helping them along those journeys uh, to try and get the best out of, uh, you know, out of the, the compliances that are out there. But the, the scary thing about that is it's just gotten, the focus has shifted from just having a, a stamp of compliance in the organization to actually combating real inside crime, um, you know, in, in terms of people now coming off the big portions of money, um, you know, creating lots of hurt and, and anger and malicious intent in organizations. It's just gotten progressively worse. Um, from Adult Technologies, our, our mission and vision is to, to drive human progress, but that, that comes with taking care of people, that comes with taking care of businesses, um, and that's typically what we want to do. And so that's where we are in the world. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be showcasing what, what we've developed from a strategy perspective in the organization, but more so also the perspective that we see, um, because I think that's important. Um, a lot of the, the Dell Technologies um, future is in what we see from our customers now, what we see our customers doing and what their goals are going to be for the future and building um, technology that can help accelerate growth, that can help accelerate businesses into those future goals that they are trying to get to. And cyber recovery is one of those things that we've developed over the last, like I say, 10 years. In the last five years, we've really accelerated the development of it. We've uh, created it into an extremely mature product um, and it's taken off very, very well. And I'm happy to say that we have recovered lots of businesses so far in the world from cyber attacks. So that's also quite cool. Normally we always start off by saying, you know, this is how many businesses out there have been attacked and they couldn't recover. But I'm glad to say on this call this morning that, you know, we've, we've successfully recovered quite a few customers out there. Oh, I also, like I said, I don't want to go too much into the negative, um, but just, you know, touching on some local hits late, I think Transnet was quite a big one. It, it made headlines in the news. Um, if you work for an organization that deals with Transnet, you most likely were impacted by that as well. Um, and, you know, like Mike was saying earlier on, you know, having analytics, having AI, having all of those things, is actually starting to get more and more critical. The reason why is if you go and read any of the articles on Transnet cyber attack, to this day, no one really knows how these people got in. Um, there's speculation, but there's nothing concrete that shows what happened. There's, you know, we know what they attacked, how they attacked it, but no one knows how they got in. And that, I think, for me, if I'm a business owner, is going to be something that's going to keep me up at night for a long time. Um, now, why I say if you worked with Transnet um, and if you ever dealt with Transnet, you might have been impacted is because a lot of our customers at Dell Technologies do work with Transnet and some of them were not paid on time. Uh, I personally know some people that do work at Transnet who never got their salaries on time. That is, for me, more of a you know, problem in the world than just you know, the reputational damage. Now you are impacting someone's family you are impacting someone else's business. Um, and I think that's something, you know, that it sits close to me because a lot of the time, 
when businesses start thinking about cyber recovery and security, we always think of ourselves. So we always think about our data, our business, our staff, but we don't often think about our customers, our suppliers, all of the people that trust our business, that deal with our business, that have put 100% confidence in us. We don't often think they because they are very much likely to be impacted if your business goes under cyber attack and not just your business. So I think that's very important that, you know, I like to set the tone of that perspective whenever I present this because that is important. This is one of the first cases, uh, you know, in a, in a while, which is good, um, but it's one of the first cases in a while in the country where, you know, human beings uh, that we know every day, no matter what they do, have been impacted by this. So yeah, it, it's, it's good to think that way because it helps us understand how important resiliency is in the business. And then if you look at Experian, there's 24 million personal details on the internet lying around. Um, I think personally, I might have been, you know, ex, you know per, impacted by this as well because I've gotten quite a couple of random phone calls by people trying to sell me stuff that only the credit bureau would know. But, you know, luckily it's not robbing me or, or you know, impacting me too badly, but it could. So I think it's also something to take extremely seriously when personal details get leaked. It's not necessarily a good thing at all. Um, maybe less of an impact than what the Transnet hack was, but still Experian as a business doesn't have a very good trust record right now. And so, you know, it's less and less businesses will start to trust them. If you look at the FinTech space, um, specifically in Cape Town, if you follow, you know, um, if you follow the uh, startup scene, I love startups. And I love uh, technology, like, like Jan said, and future approaches and stuff like that. If you look at the fintech space, lots of them are starting up these little fintech companies that are doing, uh, you know, venture capital, short-term and long-term lending, uh, you know, product supply, drop shipping, all of those kind of things. And they're starting to need credit bureaus more and more. And now as a fintech, would you put your trust in someone like Experience that got hacked? That is the question that, 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 that this type of uh, hack puts out there in the market. And then another one is healthcare. What do you do with healthcare information if you, if you hack it? That's the question I ask. Um, but there's actually quite a lot. You, you know what medicine someone takes, you know all of those kind of things. And um, it's just showing you that, you know, these are almost three different entities here that have all been hacked quite badly, very exposed, made news headlines, and I, you know, that just shows you that no one, like Mike is saying, no one is getting off this, you know, with their hands clean. This is a friend of mine that I also thought, let me try and let me try and bring this into a lower model because we always talk about the big corporates, we always talk about the big banks, the Fortune 500 of the world. But this is a, a regular, uh, you know, entrepreneur, graphics designer shares a lot of detail uh, via Dropbox. And this is where he posted on the community saying that he's been attacked by ransomware and he's even had his Dropbox data increased. Is there any help? And there is, there is no response uh, from Dropbox here. So that means they don't have an answer. So, I mean, I'm just, you know, taking it straight from the big Fortune 500 right down to an individual level. Um, so if you, you know, if, if you're a startup, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're doing anything by yourself, you're, you're one man show, two man show, it's, it's important that you also, if you use IT service providers, all of these things, that you mandate them for cyber resilience strategies, because it's important to everyone, not just your organizational, you know, type of, uh, you know, sectors. I'm not going to talk about the stats, Mike went over these. I'm just going to show you what the breakdown per industry is. Look at the lowest industry on the right hand side, it is public sector, $7.1 billion is the average cost. So even the lowest sector is still over 100 million uh, if you put it into rands, which is ridiculous. Um, and it, it, you know, it gets, it gets, um, it gets, it, these numbers become um, exponents, is what we actually say it now. Um, so we always talk about this as being an exponent. And the reason why is because every year these numbers don't double, but they actually like triple or they even get um, higher 
by like, I think the last stat that we saw is probably by six, six decimals. So uh, it's a scary thought, but you can see that all industries are impacted here as well. Media could be a, you know, it could be made up of so many different individuals, energy as well, uh, insurance. Insurance is not just made up of like your big insurance brokers, but also your small brokerages in the world. They make up that number as well. So if you start unpacking this, you can see, you can start finding friends and family that are in all of these industries that could be exposed. If you look at the motivations of where people are starting to try and hack and why they're hacking, I mean, this list goes on forever. I think we're starting to see less and less from a, from a warfare perspective. We are seeing the make biggest uh, threats inside South Africa is this insider threats and this very big organized crime type of threat, which is typically your ransomware attacks, your distributed uh, denial of service attacks. All of those kind of things are starting to filter into not just corporates anymore, even the small medium businesses, like I say. Um, and so what that means is we're starting to see more of a behavioral type of approach to hacking. So what that means is people are now starting to learn a day in a very influential person's life and not necessarily always very influential. So for an example, if I'm trying to get into Glasshouse and hack them, maybe I'm going to follow Mike around for a good six months, understand what systems he's got access to, uh, who he sends emails to, to, to on a daily basis, what time does he get to the office, what time does he get, you know, access the office, does he come into the office every day, what time does he drop his kids off at school, these are the kind of things that we're starting to see more and more, quite a scary thought, but it definitely is happening because it explains a lot of how things are getting hacked. Um, if Mike needs to make payments to people, who does he get authorization from, and then as soon as I know that kind of information, it's very easy for me to go and impersonate Mike, behave like Mike and start acting as Mike and then cause sabotage into the environment. All while Mike does not have an idea where I am, what I've been doing. Uh, he has no idea I've been in the background for the last six months. And this is the kind of thing that's starting to happen. Um, the minute links come through on your email, uh, that you're not sure if you've downloaded it or whatever, you have no idea if there's spyware on there or not. You don't know what they're looking at. Uh, you know, I often got into the habit of checking if my camera's on or not. Those are the kind of things that I've now personally started doing. But if you watch the movies, um, you see it a lot and it's definitely starting to happen a lot, uh, you know, in, in the market is what we see as well. So just and then. with ransomware, I think for me, it's the biggest, you know, it, it's the biggest, um, but it's also the, the, the hardest to recover from. You know, a DDoS kind of, attack, we might be able to recover slightly easier. Uh, we might be able to get systems back running once we can, you know, disconnect all the traffic servers and things like that. But if your data is encrypted, it is extremely tough to just that or pay ransoms because it's a lot of money. I think ransomware for me is probably the worst attack that you can get. Now, if you look at this diagram, I'm not going to go too in depth into it, but I'm just showing you that pretty much this is where the target zone is. You know, it's easy to put a Trojan or a worm or something to monitor an admin. Once you've got the admin, you can start looking for backup servers and master servers on the, on the network. Once you've got access to that, you can go and encrypt that, find media servers, find external media servers like maybe DR, cloud, shares, tapes, all of those kind of things. You can start filtering your way from an admin perspective all the way into those, um, you know, sections of the network. And once you got those, and once you start encrypting or wiping those things, uh, you essentially have ransomware attack to business, which is, um, it's difficult. Like I say, it's the A lot of the time, companies have made very big investments and not even big companies, once again, I'm talking to all size businesses. There's, or, there's always an investment that's, that's getting made in disaster recovery. Um, and is disaster recovery good enough to protect you from a cyber attack? No, it's not. And the reason why is because ER is, it has its own purpose, right? It's, it, it's to cater for physical loss of the infrastructure or the environment. So if a building collapsed for whatever reason, if uh, there was a natural disaster, if there was a water pipe that burst in the data center and flooded everything, 
if there was electrical faults that caused the fire, all of those kind of things, that is pretty much what a DR is supposed to do because it's in a different geographic and it's supposed to bring you up online. It's just supposed to have automatic failure, uh, failover, and at least all your critical systems can be brought up in a different regional uh, location. When a ransomware attack happens, majority of the attacks that we've seen, they start by getting your DR first. So they all start by encrypting your data at the DR site, and then they'll move into production. And once they've done that, then they've got you. And if you go to DR, yeah, it's as good as nothing. And why is that? Because if you get into somebody's production network, it's relatively simple to see where DR is. There's more than one replication link happening that's you know replicating data into systems from production to DR. Um, some people go and label servers on clustered networks DR box 102. You know, also it's you know not to say that that's wrong, but it makes it obvious. Um, it's also like if, if you want to find the backup server in the organization, you type in backup on the domain search, you will probably will find it, you know, so even just things like that, we don't think of them when we're building this out, but that's how simple we've actually made it for them to get into our systems. Um, and so what cyber resiliency means is that we create a separate environment away from production and away from DR that becomes the cyber recovery vault. And I'll explain that now in a little bit more depth. But essentially, that is an environment that we build and strategize to not have visibility from production or DR. So if a hacker gets into your organization, they can get into your production, they can get into your DR, but they can't see where your cyber vault is. And that is very important. And even if they did see your cyber vault, we've got mechanisms inside that vault that will not allow them to go and encrypt data in there. And so that's why, you know, from a, from a Dell Technologies perspective, we've led the way. We, we've got a, we've launched our, our, I don't want to call it a product because it's so much more than a product. It's not just something you buy and, and, it, and, and then it solves the world's problems from a cyber perspective. This is a strategy. It's a, it's a resilience policy that you are, you, you're investing in. Um, this is delivered typically through through very strategic partners we've got in the boss house being the primary one for us. Um, and it comes with a whole bunch of, of, of uh, external things than, than just physical, you know, hardware and softwares. It comes with training. It comes with, you know, all of the, the policies that you'd set up, recovery strategies, all of those kind of things is essentially what we've developed the solutions to. And like I said, we've led the way. So in 2015, we were the first isolated recovery solution. And what that means is that we were the first, first company to write immutable data into a storage appliance. And when we did that, no one could delete that data unless it's expired by admins that have been configured that have to all give each other approval to do that. I'll get into that detail a little bit later on as well. 2018, we built cyber recovery uh, so PowerProtect Cyber Recovery Solution, like I said, it is a software-defined strategy that does, uh, you know, that is combined with hardware requirements, but it comes with consulting, it comes with professional services that come in and help you as a business build out a cyber resilience strategy. So what that means is it's, it helps you identify people to a point to own the strategy, what they do in the event of a, of a cyber attack, where do you go first, what data do you restore first? I'm not going to get too much involved in that discussion today. That I'm going to leave up to Rudolf. He's one of the professionals that, that handle that for us. But I'll talk more about, like I say, the Dell Technologies perspective, why we do what we do and what we think is the best. And then in 2019, we launched the Sheltered Harbor Initiative. So if you don't know Sheltered Harbor, it's one of the biggest frameworks for cyber recovery in the world. Um, developed in the United States of America. Um, if you want to go read more about that, I can also share with you some information after this. But essentially, what America did was they thought of like D-Day. So they thought, what if all the banks get hacked and people lose all of their credit information, all of their money in their account because the banks don't have record of this? What if that happens one day? Who's protecting the people? Um, because think about it, if you wake up one day, your bank account's been wiped, your credit information's been gone, uh, you don't know, you know where your salary is coming from, all of that stuff.
can you live? So that's what, what America did. Um, so it, it started in America, it's obviously works its way across the world. But essentially, they wanted to build out a resilience platform to say, if this ever does happen, if hackers bring us digitally to our knees, can we recover? And in the beginning, there was no confidence, right? With the current technology in the world, there was just no confidence in that. And so what we did was after launching our product and understanding what our customers want from that perspective, we were, became the first solution provider that is sheltered harbor approved for recovery. So that's just to give you, you know, perspective of how seriously we've taken this and how seriously this is actually being, um, you know, driven worldwide. So it's not just, you know, it's a product that helps you prevent cyber attacks. No, it's more of a recovery platform so that if the inevitable ever happens, that's what can happen. And it's trusted by over 300 customers Globally, there is a hell of a lot more than that. I cannot tell you though, because no one likes to share that they've running cyber vaults. So that's also just one thing to, to look at. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a small number. It just means some customers didn't want to give us references. And uh, that's fair, right? You don't want to tell everyone in your house or all your visitors uh, where the safe is in your house. You don't want to do that. So very, very understandable thing. This is what it looks like for us. Okay, so what it looks like is you've got your corporate network with your production environment with everything, right? From web servers to databases to client computing, uh, you know, to cloud, to identity management, to security settings, all of those things in your production network, day-to-day -day operationally stuff that uh, that you need to take care of. And then just off of that, we've got the cyber recovery. So this can set off production, it can also sit off of DR as well. And it doesn't really matter to us where you put it as long as we get access to the data. And all we do is we create synchronization between the two and an air gap. And what an air gap is, is a replication link that we um, initiate autonomously uh, when data needs to be collected and put into the vault. And then we cancel that link at the end. So it's not a constant replication link that's always happening. Very tough for a hacker to find this. But like I said, even when they do, it doesn't make matter because when your data does go into the vault, it's immutable. So meaning that nothing can run in there. This is hardened by a Unix powered uh, operating system with very hardened security protocols on it. And there's no executable that can run inside of those directories at all. So nothing can go and delete that data other than expiration that needs to be set up by various different admin approvals on the network. And then when we do restore the data, when we want to test it, all of that kind of thing, we actually copy the data out of the immutable directory. We don't move it. And when we copy it out, that will go into a sandbox. And that's when we run analytics and AI and machine learning and you know, make it restorable, browsable, all of those kind of things. And I will, I'll talk more about that in a, in a few other slides as well. This is how you got to look at it from a recovery perspective. So every day or, you know, every hour or however many intervals you want this in, you create mutable copies, immutable checkpoints that you're putting the whole time into the vault. And then what happens is if you do get attacked, it will normally take a little bit of time for you to once you discover the points of detection, which you know should take up to 24 hours, no more than that. Um, obviously, with our analytics, we can get it down by a lot more than that. But generally, we say you know up to 24 hours, you should know when you've been attacked and discover the point of detection. Um, I personally have never seen that. Though. Uh, for an example, I don't, I think, you know, some organizations, it's weeks before they've realized they've been hacked. Um, and that's, that's why analytics should not be downplayed in this type of scenario. Essentially, once you've done that, you're going to start making decisions. You're going to start shutting down production. You're going to start quarantine machines. You're going to check your DMZs. You're going to go start doing lots of exploration stuff. And then you're going to start assessing how bad this is, right? Did they get into anything? Did they only get into payroll? Can we just restore payroll? Uh, or did, is everything wiped? Or do we have downtime? What is the actual impact? And that normally can take up to 48 hours. Yes, it should not take more than that. 
then you'd go back to your last isolated data recovery point. Now, this can be the entire corporate network if you want to put everything in the vault, or this can just be your critical systems. But while this is all happening, so while you, this is all happening, from your point of detection, you can initiate the copy or the restore of this isolated recovery point in the same 24 hours as the destruction or point of detection. Um, so you can start you know, restoring your data there. Now, you can copy it into the production. Or you can also create hosts in the vault environment that are ready to go and have the restores um, done so that you can get back and up, back up. And if you copy data back into prod, you still might be compromised. That often, um, I'm, I'm not too sure if Mike showed that stat, but there's another statistic that says, you know, I think more than 70 or 80% of organizations that pay ransoms get attacked again very, very soon afterwards. So, you know, that, that could be something why you wouldn't want to go and put data back into prod immediately. But it's there to do it if you need to do it. So now you've got your, your data back and you can comfortably start resuming operations. And within 24 to 48 hours, you're back up and running, essentially. While you're still doing the investigation, while you're still looking at what, what prevention software or what prevention firewall or whatever this might have gotten through, uh, if it might have been an insider, who this might have been, this is essentially the illustration that we show to show customers of how quickly the recovery can actually be. Look at this. This is just a practical demonstration. Um, it's the best demonstration we could possibly give you uh, to get the picture clear in a, uh, in a PowerPoint. Uh, but essentially, you know, if you've got your, your primary backups and you write them from production into a, your, your primary backup storage, that's great. This can consist of your exchange servers, SQL, SAP, HANA, VMware, DB2, Oracle, whatever your application layer is. Uh, you know, obviously supporting both VMware and Hyper-V, you, you back up normally. With your backup software, you write backups into your production pocket device um, with your catalogs and you run that. And while this is happening, all we're doing is we're creating a small link, small replication link that is between device one and device two. This is how you can even go through a top of record. Uh, out the back of both devices. Um, we create that link and then we start copying the data across into a normal standard directory. Once the data is copied across, we disable the link immediately. So now production backups still resume, everything happens normally. And now in the vault, we start performing our own thing. Primary directory, we get into what we call a retention lock directory. And what a retention lock directory is, is essentially that immutable directory. It means nothing can go in here and delete data. Now, a lot of the time we get asked the question, and you, why are my data is already encrypted? Will I have an encrypted data going into this directory? The answer is yes, you will. But you can go back to the copies because you can store multiple copies in here. Um, so you can go back to the copies that are not encrypted and restore from there. Um, so that is to show you what can happen. So essentially, once we do that, um, and we just keep creating more copies of it. So you'll see that all of these, if you see on the right-hand side, it says PIT 1 to 4. Uh, that just stands for point in time. So you can go back to any point in time to where your data wasn't encrypted and restore from there. Quite, quite cool and quite important. Um, so even if you do have an encrypted copy, uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna mean that you can't recover. And even if your cyber attack goes into this device and they shut it down, it's still not gonna affect that directory because it's locked down so um, so neatly and it's a hardware lock as well as a software lock. It's not just a software object lock that uh, some of our competitors in the market do. This is a hardware and software lock on the data as well. Like I said, when we want to start playing with the data, want to restore it, want to test it, or in the event of a cyber attack, we still don't touch that directory. We take the data, we copy it out of that directory, and we run a protocol called a fast copy. What a fast copy does is it allows us to copy data on a data domain out of one location into a new location without using up the same amount of disk space. So a very cool feature, helps us keep it very more secure. 
And obviously, once it's in a restore directory, we can then start restoring data into, you know, through our backup server and back onto another cluster that we've had. Or if you've rebuilt production, we can redirect to restore at production. And that's pretty much what a vaulted uh, strategy for an organization looks like. So this is the technical part. This is like the tech stuff. Um, like I say, who is the guy that you phone if you've been hit by an attack and you need to start accessing data out the vault? Those are questions that I'll leave for Rudolph because that's what Rudolph and, and the Glasshouse team are very good at. They build that strategy for you in an organization. They help you deliver the policies. Uh, how long should you be keeping copies of data in the, the, in the vault? Um, you know, how do you set up your administrative approval process for expiring data? How do you do all of those kind of things? That is something that they are an extremely powerful partner for us to do. Uh, and they help with that as well. And it's all been driven by Dell as well in the background. So Dell Technologies is always there, but Glasshouse is essentially very well versed in that as well. So I'll leave that up to Rudolph. This is just more on the regulatory stuff. So looking at that, um, these are three of the, or four of the, of the compliance um, standards that, we, that we've met just by our architecture. Okay, so having an air gap is primary for the FFIEC. Um, then also having the integrity and the resilience is, is, is very critical to GDPR. And this list goes on and on and on. Uh, so I don't think I need to elaborate too much on here. But you can see there's very, very influential compliance uh, metrics for this. And, you know, even the FBI uses something similar. <laughs> they actually use this, but I don't think we're allowed to say that. But yeah, it's, it's pretty much um, just goes without saying. I mean, the FBI also has uh, their own compliance standards that they've published in the world. Uh, when, when the whole Apple debacle went on, we saw what the FBI's requirements were for data. So I think it was extremely uh, cool to know that, you know, us as a vendor had very similar concepts. And then obviously, you know, we're not saying we've, we're the only ones in the world, right? There's, there's other people or other softwares, other, other vendors that do something similar. And it's always good for us to showcase our differentiating factors. Because we are not the same. We have spent lots of money on this. We have developed the strategy over overnight. And so what we've done is we've, we've built characteristics uh, that range from good, better, and best. Um, and that is something that we can share with you as well so that you can see it in detail. But this is something that does, does help us stand out. You know, some of the other solutions only do one or the other thing. So some solutions just do air gaps. Uh, some of them only do isolated copies. Some of the isolated copies are done by software, uh, that specific software that has to mount onto file directories. Um, you know, the list goes on. Some of them don't use uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Some of them don't know how to do the restores because they're not doing um, metadata backups or they're not copying catalogs across into the vaults. There's certain things that, you know, some of our, our competitors that have started to embark on the same journey are missing. Um, and so it's important that when you're evaluating a cyber resilience strategy for your business powered by a vendor or a partner, that you evaluate all of these types of things. Also look at the, the levels of cyber recovery. You don't have to have recovery hosts and all the, the stuff in the beginning. Typically, you could start off with whatever you're comfortable with in your budget. So you could start off on level one, which is just a vault. And you need to recover. You'd have to you know, connect your vault to um, production or to an, an, a storage array or another um, host and start restoring your data from there. And then you'd have a little management host that helps you out there. In level two, that's when you'd have a restore host already there for you. So you wouldn't have to go and uh, copy data into production or anything like that. You could just have a restore host and your backup server would be um, there as well. So you could browse what you need to recover. So you don't have to recover everything. You could recover just one system or you could recover a uh, application that just does files or, or whatever it might be it you know you don't have to go full blown and then level three and four would be where we actually start running validations against the copies on a weekly basis where we start uh, introducing bigger hosts to run more of a capable environment and that's where we can also introduce CyberSense analytics which is a, a product that we run with us as well and what CyberSense does 
is does all of that AI and machine learning. So it scans data in flight before it gets to the vault. And when it's in the vault, it also gets scanned. And it starts building a learning model to learn if data has changed over time and if that could be a threat or not. This is it. So what it does is it scans the critical data as it comes in. Uh, it runs analytics over it, more than a thousand statistics rated over that. It will keep running this analysis to create the machine learning algorithm and it will learn what good data and bad data looks like for you. Um, it will just keep repeating that process and it will always give you a very comprehensive forensic investigation and if you've been attacked or it can give you very real time type of alerting uh, that is also critical. So like I said, we're trying to get rid of this long time frame of, of identifying when we got hacked and how long we got hacked uh, and how long ago we got hacked and all of those kind of things. So this is the kind of stuff that we want to make sure you know, is, is relevant because otherwise, if you're just running a vault, like I said, uh, what do you start with restoring? Um, that's, that's always the biggest question. And this is also talking more about the analytics. So talking about, you know, we're not just the company that says we do analytics. We, we've got a whole range of things that we analyze. So number one is we always looking at different attack vectors that we're scanning, we're looking at corrupted file details, changes and deletions in data. So I don't know if you've ever seen the dot um, file extension that gets put on when you get attacked by ransomware. Um, we will scan and see if there's any dot funds in the data as well, so we can alert you immediately. Um, we'll look at breached executables, so executables that should not or were not administratively approved on systems. We'll, we'll, we'll always scan for that in data if, we, if we're scanning copies of data. And then we'll always be looking at the recovery of the last good copy. So we'll always just keep reporting and feeding back onto that as well. And then this is just a small little um, screenshot of what it looks like. So if you log into cyber recovery and you go into alerts, you'll see a little alert on the right hand side here, and it will give you all of that information. So it'll say how many infections have been found, uh, you know, when it was found, which directory, uh, which policies this in breach of, what the source part, what the source path was, and what the application was, all of those kind of things are all detailed there as well. But this can also automatically just be sent to you by email. And then on the left hand side is just a graphic view of how you can set your policies, manage your policies, and see some real time data on your vaulted environment. Going back into the scanning is we also scan the full block of data. So we don't just scan metadata which is majority of the problem in the world with a lot of the solutions that do scan. They scan the meta. So they scan the extension, the size, the location of the file. That is good stuff to scan because from that you can typically detect everything, right? But what if I go and embed a hyperlink inside a document, inside paragraph 19 of a 300 paragraph PDF with malware in it? How do I, how, how is that detected from the metadata? And so we actually go and we scan the structure of the document with the contents itself. So we go almost, it, it gets done on a block level, but the way I like to explain it is, think about going line for line on a Word document. That is pretty much how we're busy scanning at the moment, the data that comes in. So we use a lot of compute power to do that. Um, and we've got very big engines that do that. But here's another good point. Most analytics engines that are scanning your data in production or in DR have to be connected to the cloud because they, they're leveraging databases that sit in the cloud. We don't do that. We don't connect to the cloud at all. When you get the CyberSense software, we've got a massive database that comes with that already that's going to start doing entropy uh, comparisons. It's going to start doing um, analytics against that. And then every now and then, your service provider or your, your partner or Dell Technologies will come and update that database every now and then, which means that we'll securely do it through a firewall, connect to dedicated places uh, that we source that content for. So we're actually not going to connect you directly into the cloud to get this done. So another thing to just be wary of, you don't want to have a cloud analytics engine in your vault because it's not air-gapped, it's always online. Uh, it, it will compromise the vaults because now people will see where it is and it will be very slow. So you don't want to be doing that. 
this is just more on the sheltered harbor stuff. So like I said, uh, we've got a very comprehensive case study on our website. Uh, so if, you, if you'd like to see more about it, you're more than welcome to reach out to the Glasshouse team. They're also very well versed on this. But if you do need some additional information just for your own research, um, go onto the DAL website. It's all over there. Um, it's, it's, a very, it's something we're extremely proud of. Uh, it's taken years to build, but uh, extremely valuable for us. Who starts is, is always what happens. So where do you start? Very good question that always comes up. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's a number of things. I, you know, I, I always say it's, it's important to make sure you've got the right people involved from the very beginning. Um, even if you're not necessarily going on to look for products right now, but you just want to learn more about what a strategy should look like, what the competitive strategies look like, it's good to get a partner like someone like Glasshouse involved in the very beginning, start chatting to them about where you know you should start because they work with all shapes and sizes of organizations. And they can say, you know, do a do a good overview for you. They look at things like your networking in the beginning. They look at things like your authentication mechanism, look at what your IP looks like, look at storage, look at documentation that you might have or, or you don't have, or what checklists that should be in place. This is all delivered by them but you can also start small, okay? So you'd, like I say, we've got the different levels. You can start by doing bits and pieces of things. And if you need to know what is the most important to start with, that is also something like a good comprehensive assessment would, would give you. Um, and you don't even have to pay for an assessment. You can do an assessment with them. They can have a look at a few things and just see what needs to be taken care of. If you need something more comprehensive, there are obviously paid ones available, but it's not always necessary for this. So. To rec my recommendation is always, you know, to you don't have to start big. You can start by putting one application in a bulk for now. You don't even have to put in all your mission critical applications. You could just put in some, like a payroll or your ERP system or your warehouse management system or something that could bring your business to your knees. That is typically something that you'd start with uh, right in the beginning of building out a cyber resilience strategy. Also, just looking at the management of this, right? I mean, it's a comprehensive dashboard as well. It's been built over time. We've uh, we've brought it into a nice GUI uh, when this when this first came out and looked so good, but now it looks brilliant. Um, yeah, it's all based on HTML5, so you can actually log into this from a tablet. Uh, but you should not be logging to this at all, to be honest. Um, it's not something you want to be visiting. This is something you want to leave in the capable hands of an administrator who's got only a secure log into this via firewall or dedicated link or VPN or something like that. Um, you don't want lots of people to be accessing this. You will just get the automated reports from this and you'll be sharing that with the organization to show everyone which data is protected and what the latest updates on that is as well. So typically great dashboard, but you don't want to be playing with it every day. You know, you're, it's, it's like you're safe. You don't want to keep opening and closing the safe door to check that your ID or your passport or something's in there. You know it's in there. You check it every now and then. That's it. You know, forget about it kind of thing. Your emails will tell you whether or not something's going wrong. Um, because it's also, it, that's, that's something that we all need to learn, right? So when it comes to security products and protocols and all of those kind of things, we don't want to tell everyone we've got it. Some customers don't even allow us to tell some of the IT staff that they've got faults. Um, and that's a true story. It, it, I promise you it's, it we get, it's becoming more strict than I ever anticipated this becoming. So yeah, this is just showing you there. And then obviously you'd get a security officer appointed in that appointment. You'd also then get different sorts of admins. So for an example, like I was saying earlier on to expire data, you can set this up where you need you know, eight admins to go and approve that expiration change. Um, and so that makes it incredibly difficult for anyone to, to go and this, um, expire data. This is what the threat protection looks like. So if you go into alerts and policies, uh, you can set all of this up. Um, if you go and look on our website, there's a little lab there as well that can also show you more information. It's a little bit more interactive than just a screenshot, but it shows you a lot of detail. And I think that's part of our core messaging is the level of detail that we go into is extreme because it's that level of detail. And when you have that level of detail in all of your, you know, day-to-day -day administration, it makes it a lot easier 
for you as a business to uh, to detect and recover. Now, where does this fit into the NIST framework, right? So I'm sure if you if you're familiar with security, if you're not familiar familiar with security. But there's something called the NIST framework out there, right? Most organizations are adopting the NIST framework. It's a security framework uh, that all organizations should be implementing. Um, some, some news for you from us at Dell. Um, we've pretty much got a product that caters for every part of the NIST framework, which is identify, protect, detect, respond, and most importantly for us as a business, recover. Because what we've been seeing is that it, there's so much that's getting through on all the other platforms, right? So from a defend perspective, things get through. Identification fails sometimes. Uh, protection fails, detection fails. All of these things fails. UTM threat management, uh, firewalls, IPSs, uh, you know, intrusion prevention scanners. These things fail us sometimes. We don't see the insider attacks that come. And so recovery is your last resort of defense against a cyber attack. And so that's why we see it as extremely important to, to focus on from the very, very beginning. Just to close off, why, why should anyone look at or consider technologies for a cyber resilience strategy? Like we were the first to market with our isolated air gap and isolated recovery um, strategy. We've always had multi-level or multi-layer security design in all of our arrays of products and suites. Um, we have developed this in a very agile first world type of methodology, which allows us to be automated and orchestrated and obviously deliver a modern experience to our customers. We've also got a secure fault-based analytics, like I was explaining. So that's, in, that's extremely important. Like I said, non-cloud connection still keeps your air gap in intact. Very, very comprehensive. And then also, you know, if you need to see where we fit in in the world, Sheltered Harbor is, is a good place to go and start your investigation and your, and, your, and your research. And we also have a mature solution. Like I said, we are, we are ahead of the playing field because we've had this for five years already, this entire strategy that you've seen today. But just also know in the back of your mind that our isolated air gap, that type of strategy started 10 years ago for us. So with that, thank you so much. I'm going to hand this back to you. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, that was a, a wonderful and in-depth view of, of how the system works. Uh, I'm sure that folks tuning in today really appreciate that, like getting a, a deep sense of, of exactly how the system would work. Um, you know, and, and whether it would suit their organization. So thank you very much. We've already received um, a, a bunch of nice technical questions, which we will uh, get to at the end of the presentations. There's also another poll up, please vote in that. Uh, and I'd also like to encourage you to, uh, uh, to continue posting questions. So as I said, we've, we've received a couple of, of nice technical ones related to Matthew's last presentation. If you have a question relating to ransomware, to uh, cyber defense, anything in that vein, uh, please pop it in the Q&A box and uh, we will uh, get around to it at the, end of the, at the end of the presentations. Now, with, uh, without any further ado, I would love to introduce Rudolf Fasahi, who's a solutions architect at Glasshouse South Africa. Rudolf has over 20 years experience in technology and has worked across a variety of platforms and implementation requirements. As the solutions architect at Glasshouse, Rolf brings his technical skills to support the company's customers. Rolf's passion is data management and protection, and he offers technical expertise in a range of platforms, environments, and services. Rolf is going to tackle the topic of cyber recovery, technical competencies, and with that, and with that, Rolf, over to you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, first off, I promise my presentation is much shorter than my previous two presentations that were held. Um, what I'd like to do this morning is I would just like to change gear a little bit. And I would like to say that you as a customer has made the correct choice. You have implemented the Dell Cyber Recovery Vault. Everyone is sleeping much better at night. And now one of the big questions that always comes up is, why, how do I know what or when to recover from the vault? 
And the answer to this simple question is not as straightforward as we think. There's number one, a technical answer. When the analytical software in the vault has detected that the data has been compromised, we do know that some form of recovery will be done from the vault. But operationally, it's much more complex to just simply recover data from the vault. And to answer this operational complexity is we need to look at the different types of data recovery, operational recoveries, disaster recoveries, and of course, cyber recoveries. Now, operational recoveries, these are your day-to-day -day type of recoveries that keep the backup team busy. A user accidentally deleted a file from a file server, the application is crashed, corrupting a Word document. Maybe a DBA accidentally dropped a table from a production database. These are all operational recoveries and they are basically caused by user error and not necessarily by infrastructure or platform failures or even site failures or there's no security incidents as part of operational recoveries. These are your run of the mill data restores. Disaster recoveries, of course, this is when you've had a disaster such as a complete site failure due to a flood or a power loss or an earthquake. Maybe you've had major infrastructure failures such as a storage array has gone down or your core network has gone down. Once again, security is not compromised during a disaster, but you need to enable the continuity of business by failing over to that secondary site and you need to do it as soon as possible. And this is why disaster recovery is enabled by some form of replication technology. And then to iterate again what Matthew touched on, disaster recovery is not cyber recovery because you usually replicate everything in production to disaster. So if you've been compromised, you are replicating that cyber trojan to your disaster recovery kite as well. So cyber recoveries. The drivers for a cyber recovery is simple. You can either get a cyber sense alert from your vault you would notice a sudden mass encryption or deletion of data in your environment, or if you're lucky or not, you'll receive a ransom note from a hacker or a hack group. But these are all the drivers for a cyber recovery, and it leaves a lot of unknowns. For instance, which plot platforms have been compromised? Is my Active Directory and DNS still safe? Is my VMware or Hyper-V environment safe? Which of my applications has been um, damaged? Has the network been compromised? How far and how much is my security being compromised? And, and this is the, rush, the, the reality of this situation is, have my staff been compromised? Because a lot of these attacks come from inside your um, environment. So all of these unknowns impacts our ability to determine trust. With operational recoveries or even with disaster recoveries, it's usually quick to determine the trust. But during a cyber recovery, it's difficult. You need to find out, can I trust my data? Can I trust my platforms or applications? Can I trust my network? Can I trust my staff? And keep in mind that a true cyber attack will always have multiple attack vectors impacting our ability to easily and quickly determine that trust. So the expertise and competence is needed to determine trust. Well, the first thing we have to realize is that it's not the backup administrator or backups team or a responsibility to decide what or when to do cyber recoveries. Cyber attacks requires a business-wise response from a team made up of the correct expertise and competencies. And I'd like to touch on some of those competencies that a lot of people don't even think of during a cyber attack. For instance, public relations. You will need a team to manage that reputational damage incurred by a cyber attack. Mike has touched on things like companies who actually went out and paid the ransom to get their data back. With social media and false news spreading like wildfire these days, you really, really need to manage that, that reputational damage that is caused by these cyber attacks. Next up is you will definitely need executive leadership. This leadership will be in the form of maybe a CIO or even a CISO, but it is essential to understand not just what happened, but to guide the business's understanding of what has happened, who was attacked and what was attacked. I think the logical thing is that the core of your competencies that you'll require during your stack is the IT teams. These are the teams that are responsible for all the areas of your infrastructure, and it will not only help you to determine which platforms can be trusted, but also which expertise are needed to restore as quickly as possible from a cyber attack. The next competency will be the governance, risk management, compliance, and legal. 
these are the guys that not only need to find out what has been compromised, what is the effect of the compromise, but for example, for financial institutions, you will need to notify the governing body, bodies. How long after the attack has been found do you need to, to notify these people? What do you need to notify? If there was personal information stolen during the attack, these are all things that your governance and your legal departments would be able to help. And then last but not least, you will need HR and even maybe facilities management. Facilities management, do your staff still have access to the buildings and the campuses? If your security system for physical access has been part of your IT, what are the chances that scanning an access card will still open those doors or lift those booms? HR will be required. What staff issues you're going to have during such a uh, cyber attack? Maybe the guys will need to work overtime. You need someone to look after the well-being of your staff. Maybe you've identified the staff member who was actually part of the attack, and how do we continue treating that staff member, and how do we deal with it? At the end of the day, fighting a cyber attack is not a simple matter of restoring data from the vault, but knowing what and who to trust and which expertise are required to cover all angles for a unified response. And we at Glasshouse can help you every single step of the way to make a successful recovery from a cyber attack. Thank you. Thank you, Rudolf. That was short, sweet, and to the point. Um, so uh, there one more poll uh, is going up right now. Um, please uh, fire through some responses to that. And uh, then we are gonna go into our panel discussion and I'll be calling um, on Mike, Matthew, and Rudolf to, to come back online so that we can answer some, some questions. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be the one having all the fun. Um, so we'll start with one of the one of the viewer questions that was posted just now um i am uh, also just watching our time so uh with i don't want to i don't want to uh, blather on too long i want to get right into it um Mornay richards asked uh and uh matthew i think uh, i'm gonna put this question to you to start with intermittent replication policy starts on specific times does that mean that the replication is asynchronous Good question. Um, yes, yes, it would be asynchronous replication. Um, but we don't like to, you know, we don't like to think of it too much as replication, um, because it is using a very different type of protocol. Um, it's governed by the two operating systems of the storage device. So what happens is, it, we call it synchronizing, because you pushing the data across into the point. It, it's not data that needs to be referenced as live data. So it's perfectly fine for it to be um, you know, asynchronous. Um, but essentially, once data is available to be copied into the vaults, depending on the policies that have been defined, what the storage will do is it will create a link between the two devices. Um, and that link can only be accessed via a credential that gets generated by the two storage devices. So there's no credential that actually gets stored in any databases or anything like that. Um, normally with other you know, technologies, you've got credentials that get stored for replication inside databases of backup servers and things like that. But for vault replication, uh, we actually don't store any credential. It just gets regenerated by key phrases the whole time. Only the two storage devices will ever know what they are. And the minute that link gets uh, disabled, both of those credentials are null and void. They can never ever be used again and we have to keep regenerating that. So yes, it is asynchronous, but you can also up the interval, right? You can, you can say you want to replicate data in there every 50 minutes, not, not necessarily the, the best advice for us because we want to try and keep it an air gap, but um, yeah, you could, you could set those intervals after the policy that you want. Uh, so yeah, I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Yeah, um, Mornay, do let us know uh, if you have a follow-up. Um, and one of mine, um, and, uh, and Mike, I think I'm gonna ask this one to you. If there is already a recovery point within the business, is there really a need to invest in cyber recovery solutions? Um, yes, and the reason being is recovery points and uh, recovery objectives are, are set out um, when it comes to disaster recovery. 
that's based on the recovery of data that may be deleted, as, as Rudolf was alluding to earlier on, where a DBA uh, goes and drops tables or does something like that, or when there's a disaster recovery, what is your failover time? What, where, how long will it take you to get the application back up and running? And you have those um, those recovery points that are sitting inside uh, your, your uh, environment at the moment as part of your business continuity environment or business resumption plan. With cyber recovery, this thing could be small. It could be very targeted. They are going to uh, destroy your capability to restore. They're going to take out your backup catalog. They're going to take out your system tools. They're going to take out all of these types of things. So your traditional recover points okay, are not going to hold true. Uh, your backups are going to be infected. These guys sit inside your systems on average. The statistics are saying between six weeks uh, to six months. Okay, so this is propagated to your disaster recovery, to your, all your backups. You need something that sits above your traditional recover points. And that's what this provides you with, that immutable copy of data that is totally separated from the rest of your systems and your environments. So current traditional recover points, they are not the, they are not the magic elixir that they are for a isolated data recovery or a disaster recovery. In cyber resilience, you need to think differently and you need to put a different uh, recovery point and different recovery objectives in place um, because this is deliberate. This is somebody that is coming out there to try and extort, extort data from you. The behavior is, is, is different. The event is different. So traditional recover points have to be totally reviewed and, and new ones added and built in and uh, complemented in your environment. Mm, great. Thank you very much. And, and Rudolf, uh, uh, one for you. How would one ensure that your golden copy doesn't get hacked and encrypted since in order to back up that data, you still need to use your network to back up that data? Well, remember the thing with the vault is that we are actually replicating your backups and your backup catalog into the vault. And that air gap is very important to isolate you from being attacked at that level. And remember that the analytic software that we're using inside the vault will immediately pick up if something is suspicious with your data. So an isolated vault with that air gap physically disconnecting your vault from the network is what saves you in this instance. Ah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, Matthew, I've got another question from Mornay. Uh, that link that gets created that in your presentation, is that an FCIP link or is it a DWM, a DWDM link? Oh, great question. Great question. Um, I'm glad there's a, there's a, there's a technical audience of it. Um, no, um, so no, it's not an FCIP link. Um, look, we, we recommend running uh, just a dedicated, uh, you know, RC to RC um, 10 gig link. Um, if it needs to be very big, though, if we're doing very big, um, you know, copies of data, we can run it all the way up to about 100 um, gigs. But it doesn't have to be FC. Um, we, we actually don't really recommend that because it does, you know, it, it has no benefit. And the reason why we say that it has no benefit is because we use a different protocol for that copy. So we run a protocol called um, DD Boost, which is our own proprietary developed protocol. And what that protocol does is it optimizes the way we copy data over networking. Um, so the amount of um, the amount of blocks that we can transfer is, is rapidly much faster than a Microsoft type of protocol or any type of you know, standard protocol in the industry used today. Uh, and the cool thing is quite true to us. So only our technology uses that. Um, but based on that factor, we don't actually need to run any type of FC connections. We just run a, a, def, a, a dedicated link uh, over Great. 10 gig. And, um, and just for folks who might not know who are being bombarded with acronyms, FCIP stands for Fiber Channel over Internet Protocol. Is that correct? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look it up too. <laughs> so it's all good. We just throw acronyms around and uh, we don't think about what they actually stand for. Um, so uh, one, uh, a couple of more questions uh, and folks, uh, please feel free to, to um, keep uh, shooting through questions to the Q&A box um, so that we can answer them live. We'd love to do that. Uh, and um, Mike, I'm going to um, 
Uh, actually, uh, Rudolf, I'm going to come to you first and then I'll go to Mike. Rudolf, uh, what can I do if I've been hit by a ransomware attack and I don't have a recovery system in place? Don't have a recovery system in place. Well, I think yeah. the first thing I would do is uh, get on my knees. <laughs> um, to tell you the truth, the sophistication and all of the multiple vectors of an attack these days, to tell you the truth, there's not a lot that you can do if it, because you simply do not know what you can trust. Um, one of the things that I don't know if it's been mentioned this, so far this morning is that when attackers gain access to your network or your systems, they don't infiltrate today and start attacking tomorrow. These guys are sitting around for up to six months at a time, sitting, watching, waiting, scanning, trying to figure out what is going on so that if they hit you on that day, they hit you properly. So your best way to recover from a cyber attack is to have a proper cyber solution in place beforehand. Because it will not only isolate your data, enable you to recover back to a known good copy of your data, but all of that analytics will also immediately tell you if something fishy is going on in your environment with your backup data. So hmm. best response, cyber recovery solution. Right, and, and, I, and uh, I, th this reminds me a little bit of what's going on um, with the Department of Justice ransomware attack right now, where they still haven't recovered months after the, the, they were hit with ransomware. And uh, also leaving us only to speculate, but uh, one of the potential answers, you know, it might not be that they're completely without backups, but that they don't know which, uh, how, how far back they have to go to get a trusted copy. Is, is, that is, is, that of, is one of the saying. big things is, um, like I said, maybe these guys have been in the network for over six months. How many companies out there actually keep backups for longer than six months? If you look mm. at your retention at that level, you will have to fall back to monthly backups or even maybe annual backups to gain your data. And I think a lot of the time spent is on finding out when last did I have a good copy. That is if you're in the position that you actually still have your backup catalogs. Remember, one of the first things a hacker will attack is your backup catalog, because if they don't stop you from recovering your backup data, it doesn't help them attacking your organization at all. And yes. uh, the CyberSense software, because it continuously and repeatedly scans through the data, building up those indexes, doing the analytics on your data, it will immediately be able to tell you your last good copy of your data was 72 hours ago or maybe yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you for that. I think it's uh, it's a very important context. Mike, uh, you sound like you have a strong opinion on this question. Should I consider paying a ransom? Okay, this is this this is a, a double edged thing. Okay, um, because it's one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't uh, type of a question. What do you do when you have no way to recover? As Rudolf said just now, you get down on your knees and you pray. Okay, um, that's th that really is because if they've been in your systems long enough, no backup is going, this stuff is going to be injected into your environments. It's going to be existing all over the place. You are not going to have the capability to recover. Um, you've got customers that you're responsible to. There are stakeholders that you're responsible to. You these guys will engineer an attack to the point of where you have no choice but to pay the ransom. So there are times when you, you, you just cannot avoid it. You will have to pay the ransom. It's simple as that. Um, if you have not had the contingencies in place and you have not put this type of thing in place, you've got a problem. Um, sometimes the easiest way to make this type of thing go away is to pay the ransom as well. Uh, the quickest get back online. Take an organization like Take A Lot. If Take A Lot was taken down through a, a, a serious cyber attack and all of their outward facing applications, web based, whatever it is, was taken down and they could not operate, for every day that Take A Lot is in the dark, they are losing millions and millions of rands. Um, what do they do if it's going to take them two to three weeks to potentially recover, even three or four days? 
what, it's a tough decision that has to be made. And this is something that cannot be left to just your IT staff to make. It has to be taken up to risk and compliance. It has to go all the way up to that boardroom with the green carpets and the big fancy oak chairs in there. Okay, those guys have to have a plan. They have to sit there. So at your sea level, you've got to make a point on how you're going to respond to a cyber attack. So this is not just a technical thing or an operational thing that happens at a lower level. You've got to have buy-in. Do you report it to the press? Do we categorically state that we are not going to take any um, uh, uh, ransom uh, threats seriously? We are not going to pay them. We will do whatever it is to, to save the data um, or to save the customer's data. What do you do at the end of the day? In the event that they don't come in and encrypt your uh, system, but they steal all your customer data and it's out there. Okay, you have no choice really in that type of environment but to go and pay a ransom, recover that data. But then, as Matthew said, nine times out of 10, they, they just uh, re ransom you and say, well, you know, pay again and pay again. And where does it stop? At some point, you've got to say, well, sorry, we're not going to pay anymore. We're now going to, uh, you know, take the hit and, and, and notify our customer base that their, their data has been stolen and take the reputational damage that comes with that. So it is very double edged. Um, They've got to have a plan. Um, and uh, the, if a customer does not have a plan, he's, he's in deep water. And if you just think implementing a full cyber recovery solution like we propose now, will actually bring down the insurance that you can apply for to insure you against a, a cyber attack at the end of the day. So how do you go about uh, doing this? Do you pay the ransom? Do you not pay the ransom? Um, do you aid in a bit criminality? They're, they're, that is answers that each and every single organization has to answer for themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it, it's, it's a moral question. It's uh, how's your customer going to treat you? How's your uh, board, your stakeholders, how are all of them going to uh, buy into this? It's, it's, it's a very uh, complex and multifaceted uh, question that has to be answered. And different organizations will take a different stance. Um, some will pay the ransom and say, let's be done with it and get on with it and we'll put the measures in place. Um, others will take an ethical stance and say no. I feel very strongly about it that, you know, aiding and abetting any kind of criminality should not be allowed. But, you know, there are people, there are, are, are lives, there are families that are dependent on businesses and sometimes uh, calls have to be made. But um, it's something, is there, there is no yes or no question, Jan. It's a very difficult one. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. And uh, just to give people context here, I mean, for example, um, in the colonial pipeline, is the brand to get back online um and and you know when you're dealing with a uh, shipping around critical energy fuel um that that powers the economy then um the, the, the question does get murky um exactly as you've said um so thank you for that i appreciate it um and we have one last technical question i know we've gone over a little bit of time but i think we have time we can we can uh, make time for one more technical question uh another one from mornay richards matthew to you are there journals needed uh, based on the size of the data to be replicated? What is the compression ratio? Uh, okay, so uh, I think first question is, is there journals needed? No, uh, no, there's, there's no journals needed um, because we, you know, we're copying across the, the metadata the whole time and the catalogs like Rudolf was saying. Uh, that's instrumental for us. And that's pretty much going to be the journal that we're referencing for most of the points in time that we're copying across. Um, the cyber recovery software will also have a bit of a journal though. So it will also have a point in the time index where it will be able to show you which copies came in at what time and what those copies were, if they were named or unnamed or whatever it might be. So that's, that's going to be your point of, uh, you know, point of, detection that you're going to go through and, and, and go and check. Um, in, in terms of the compression, I mean, the, newer, the, the newest uh, data domain appliances that we've got on the market now have, uh, have really, really strong compression as well. So even with encryption, we still have introduced what uh, we call uh, Intel QAT cards uh, into the back of the data domains, and uh, they seem to have up the, the general compression of the data domains up by by 30% above what the market standard has been. So, uh, I mean, look, proof is always in the pudding. It depends on, on so many different variables like data types and like you said, size, all of that kind of thing. But uh, 
it's, uh, it, it's, it's one of the leading appliances outside of cyber recovery, just as a normal target storage device. It's one of the leading de devices in the world. So uh, I, I'm very confident that it, that it meets, uh, meets your expectations in that, in that regard. Brilliant. Thank you very much. With that, folks, I, uh, I have to uh, bring our fun to an end. Um, it's been phenomenal and, and very informative. Thank you very much to Glasshouse for uh, arranging this, uh, for, for putting the, the webinar together. Uh, thank you for um, the, the team behind the scenes. You know who you are uh, for all the work that you've put in. Um, and just to remind you, uh, we, we were speaking with Mike Steyer, the country manager at Glasshouse South Africa, um, Matthew McEnroe, the systems, a systems engineer at Dell Technologies, and Rolf Asahi, solutions architect at Glasshouse, also in South Africa. I've been Jan Vermeulen. I'm the editor of my broadband. It's been a pleasure. Have a lovely day further.